What is up, everyone? Welcome back for another episode of Questions You Never Thought to Ask, the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast. My name is Seth Ashworth. And before we begin, begin this week's show, I would like to apologize for my tardiness in getting this one out to you. Um, I just had a tough time making the schedule work for this one with my schedule and my guest schedule being very busy. So I'm sorry. Um, that's on me. I endeavor to do better uh, in the future. As always, this podcast is supported by the people on Patreon who chip in a little bit every month. Patreon is a crowdfunding platform where you too can chip in and keep this podcast alive and keep it uh, keep it hosted and, and keep the lights on. Uh, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash Seth Ashworth. That's patreon.com slash Seth Ashworth. All right, without uh, any more further ado, let's get into it. Rudy on the track, kept him hidden in the back. Questions that you never thought to ask. Whitewater rap. Today I'm joined by the man himself, Adrenaline Rush Sturgis. Rush, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me back on. Rush, we are here this week to talk about your new upcoming film. Um, and we're talking about it somewhat in absentia because I haven't actually seen it. And furthermore... Um, the other main kayaking podcast, Hammer Factor, covered it somewhat in depth. But for people like me and people who are listening who haven't seen it yet, can you tell us what's your new film, uh, The River Runner, all about? Yeah, so it's um, basically it's a biography documentary about um, uh, the life of Scott Lindgren and his kind of rise to, to fame in, in the whitewater world. Um, and then as well, some of the kind of challenges he, he faced after he sort of left kayaking for a little while and um, had to deal with a, a brain tumor and um, a whole kind of uh, myriad of other issues. And uh, yeah, so I kind of followed his progress over the course of the last kind of three and a half, um, almost four years now, and went to Pakistan with him and filmed him paddling the Indus, which is kind of a lifelong dream of his. Um, so the, the film covers a, a lot of ground. It's, you know, about a 20, 20 year, um, sort of journey for Scott. And, um, we kind of just, uh, yeah, follow, follow his life story. And it's fair to say from what I have heard speaking to you and what I've heard speaking to people who have actually seen it, that this is not like, uh, uh, not to pin, pigeonhole you here, but a regular rush to just kayak porn flick. Yeah, it's a little different. I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, for sure, for me, it was uh, creatively a totally different type of um, process to to do this film. Uh, everything else I've done prior to this is it was more. I mean, you know, I think except uh, Jason Niagara. J Sorry, I didn't. I, I, you know, that's a different. That like is is in an, uh, like that like genre stepping like one foot in both worlds. Sure. Sure. I, I, from what I understand, the River Runner is going to be fully in the like mainstream documentary world instead of the kind of chasing Niagara like straddle the line. Yeah, totally. I mean, like I think I think chasing Niagara for me was like a, a even like a departure from what I'd done before that, which is definitely more on the like kind of shred shred flick front, but it still kind of had some elements of that. And I think like the difference is, you know, you know, with Niagara, it's like I was kind of following somebody's. Um, kind of process um, to, to, you know, wrap his process to run, run Niagara. Whereas this is like, has some elements of that, but it's really kind of a lot of recreation and, um, you know, a lot of sort of backstory um, in terms of the archival material. And then also a lot of photo treatments. And I mean, we have over a half an hour of, of, uh, of photo treatments and um, motion graphics. So it's a lot of, uh, yeah, kind of backstory for sure. That's what what was it about um Scott Lingren that kind of pulled you in because there's there's a lot of kayakers of that age of that like era of the classic like VHS uh era kayakers I call them who are like when I was 18 I used to work in a kayak store and every Saturday I'd work there and we'd watch in the background there'd be an old we'd have old kayaking movies running like constantly like from the time I arrived at work to the time I left and Scott Lingren's movies were always in the in the rotation but he wasn't the only person of that era of people who who was paddling a lot and then stepped back. Like, What was it about Scott that kind of got you hooked as you're like, oh, this could be a, a story here? Yeah, I mean, I think um, as a kid growing up and watching, you know, there's there's a lot of different standouts. I mean, um, from that 
um, from that time period, you know, um, Teo Berman, Steve Fisher, you know, Eric Link in the, in the Twitch series. And, um, I mean, many, many others, I think, um, Scott really laid the foundation. I, I feel like for what I kind of ended up doing, um, after he kind of, um, ducked out and, and by that, I mean, uh, really like kind of, you know, raising money through sponsors and, um, and also being the one that, that was out there paddling all the white water, um, you know, uh, as well as documenting it. So I think that, that for me, that was like a pretty, he was a pretty big inspiration in, in that regard. Um, and I, it's interesting cause I always thought that he really deserved, um, you know, a film of some sort, maybe not just him, but like his, his generation. Cause I, you know, there's, <clears throat> I kind of couple him in a little bit with, you know, that the whole kind of driftwood crew and, you know, the Kern brothers, the, the Knapp brothers, Charlie Munsey, um, all that, you know, this kind of whole group of paddlers that were, were, um, you know, primarily based in, in California, which is also where I grew up. And so, um, you know, it was, it was a story that spoke to my heart on, on a, a number of different levels. Um, but I think first and foremost, it, it was just, uh, you know, Scott really kind of like, um, laid the groundwork for, for kind of what I ended up trying to pursue as a paddler slash filmmaker. Yeah, he de definitely, there's like the, if you tracked the arc of river routes back through YGP, you, you know, you could make a pretty clear connection to, you know, to being in kayak movies and to Scott Linger and like, it, it, that'd be a pretty, a pretty short diagram of, of dot to dot. So how did you, how did you, um, run about, like approaching Scott with this, you just roll up at his house and be like, okay, man, like you're a cool guy. I want to make a kayak movie about you. Like, let's go. No, it kind of went through a few different phases and, um, you know, it's, I, I actually was, was, I was trying to get a film uh, made called California kayak as far back as I think like 2012, 2013, where I wanted to do the history of, of paddling in California with kind of Scott as the centerpiece. And actually it was going to be Evan Garcia as kind of like, the new generation. Um, and I just couldn't raise the funding for that. I couldn't really get enough interest. And, um, yeah, so, so once that, you know, kind of fell through, it was just kind of like, you know, tucked away. And then, um, I did a trip on middle Kings with him in like 2016 and he started kind of explaining to me a little bit more about his story. And I started to feel like it was, you know, it sounded really interesting. I thought it would be a cool short film. Um, and then, you know, it wasn't honestly until, uh, Aniel actually invited me to come to the Indus and, you know, started telling me also a little more about Scott's, you know, kind of story in the Four Rivers. And um, I guess over the course, but I'd say like between kind of like, yeah, 2016, 2017, uh, it all kind of started to come together. I still had a little bit of, at that time, um, just uh, like of a hangover from chasing Niagara and, and really didn't feel like, I didn't really want to jump straight into another feature, but that's pretty much what I yeah, kind of, kind of ended up doing. Yeah, it's almost like you, you, you fell off the chase in Niagara bus straight into the into the path of a faster moving train with the River Runner because it seems like a, a project that took even more time um, and even more resources than than chasing Niagara did. Yeah, I did. I mean, it's de definitely like um, there's some similarities. They're actually like they're about the same amount of time. It's about like each each of them was kind of like a three and a half year process from start to finish, but. Um, but very different beasts for sure. I mean, uh, you know, Niagara had its own sort of set of, you know, stresses and, and, <laughs> and problems just in terms of everything we were dealing with on that one. And this was like a totally different, um, creative challenge, which is like, honestly, a better challenge for me and kind of where I'm at in my sort of paddling life and career. It was a lot of, you know, time kind of being, being at home here in white salmon and editing and just kind of trying to, you know, really focus on, on, on figuring out how to tell a, a bigger story, you know? Other than the overwhelming amount of time it takes to make one of these like feature movies, what is the biggest, the single biggest challenge that you faced in telling Scott's story? I think the, the honestly, the biggest challenge was just the overwhelming amount of story threads that we had going on. And, um, I forget the exact number, but I want to say we shot somewhere between 25 and 30 sit down interviews. And, you know, I think we used like maybe around half of those. Um, and so it was kind of heartbreaking to film, you know, legends like Rob Lesser and, um, you know, Mark Hayden and a, a number of other just kind of awesome kayakers. And, and it just, 
like it wasn't anything like their careers are like amazing in and of themselves, but um, they just, in the end, we just didn't have time for it. And so I think that was the hardest part for me was, you know, as, as they say in editing, killing your darlings and kind of letting go of all this like epic stuff that just in the end really didn't fit into the story. And I think that I spent a lot of time and, and money really trying to like figure out, okay, how can this be a film about the history of kayaking and also Scott's story? And in the end, those two worlds were just kind of clashing too much. And it really just, it's, it's really more of a personal film um, about Scott in, in the end, you know? Yeah, I guess there's no overlapping Venn diagram part where you can where you can make that kayak fl kayak flick history of kayaking, but also tell a a personal story well. Yeah, and I think it's like that's like kind of how editing is though too. It's like you've sort of got to explore all the different threads. And I mean, it's like I did so many different edits and cuts on this film that were that I was really excited about that we kind of had to like acts you know and so maybe there's like a place for those somewhere at some point or maybe there's another story uh to be told someday but um yeah that was the hardest part for me is just just really trying to figure out the storyline and i'm sure when people like any i think like anytime you watch a movie sometimes the story like seems just so obvious but as a editor and filmmaker getting to that point uh with it is is just a really brutal and arduous process sometimes what was the biggest beta moment in the uh, whole four years of production? <laughs> biggest beta moment? Probably yeah. just like me paddling on the Indus and just getting lit up and, <laughs> and hole after hole. Um, I had the biggest beta moment. I don't know. Like, uh, man, there was, there was definitely a number of moments that were, um, you know, kind of, kind of scary that like, you know, honestly, like I, you know, yeah, I, I don't know if I can have like an exact like beater moment. There was a few like really close, close ones, you know, like, I mean, there's, there's a scene with Scott uh, flips on Scott's drop and, and, uh, you know, hits this kind of like amazing clutch roll <laughs> and watching that go down, watching that go down in, in real life was, um, was pretty, pretty scary. And um, yeah, I don't know, like, honestly, just like, yeah, watching Scott, you know, at the age of almost 50, you know, go and, and run all this like really hard white water and, and, uh, and do it well, you know, it was like pretty impressive to watch. And, you know, he definitely had some, some moments out there, but, um, you know, definitely, uh, definitely persevered. There's a scene in Chasing Niagara where, um, I, I've only watched Chasing Niagara one time, but this scene really stands out to me, um, where you and Rafa are driving back after Rafa's run, um, Saheli, maybe I think I can't remember mm -hmm. one of the big West Coast yeah. waterfalls and you're bait. I'm paraphrasing you a lot here, but you're basically saying you need to go back to the beach and do some role practice. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is there a moment like that in this movie? Cause I, that was a standout moment for me, uh, from Chasing Niagara. Not so much. No, I mean, you know, it's actually funny. Like I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm personally not even in this film, you know, um, I did not, I, I did not put myself in the river runner. So there's no real like, um, kind of friendship between Scott and I portrayed in the film. Um, it's more on is kind of the, the guy who's kind of guiding Scott and giving him, him advice and such. Um, but you know, I think it's, I think really this film is, is, is so much more about, Scott's kind of emotional arc um and and you know just him ultimately kind of becoming a better person a lot more a lot less closed off um getting therapy you know like those are those are kind of like the the, the points in in the film where you know the the subject has to sort of you know get some tough love from friends or you know get like you know like in, in the exchange with Rafa and I like just basically you know people kind of telling him to um to get help and uh, and him also realizing him uh that himself so i think yeah very very like different overall in terms of the um comparisons between the two i guess is there like a comic relief character like a sidekick character who really uh keeps the keeps the mood light or is it all just uh doom <laughs> and gloom you know i it's one the one thing i really actually I, I one of my regrets with the film is is um is there is not really like a ton of levity in it, to be honest. Like it's definitely a heavier storyline and, and it's tough because it's like we're dealing with with pretty heavy subject matter at the end of the day. Um, you know, this medical journey um, with the tumor, um, you know, Scott's sort of history with like 
you know, some, some substance abuse and, and just kind of, um, some of the darkness, you know, uh, that he's kind of dealt with, but, but yeah, they're definitely, I think, you know, I think the most, um, sort of like warm, um, you know, moment in there is just honestly like Scott's like genuine friendship with Oniol and, uh, this sort of like passing of the torch to the next generation. And like, there's, there's moments of, of that I think are, are on the brighter side, but I, I can't really say that there's like a, a ton of comic relief in this one, which is, which is hard for me because I, I do love humor and, um, I like to celebrate that in, in videos, but this is, this is kind of a, a different story for sure. I would say one of the reasons I have only watched Chasing Ragger one time is that I, uh, I found it hit very close to home for me. Um, and the the comic relief that those little moments like that that standout one um you know really helped me keep uh keep smiling when there was times where I was like oh man this is this is this is getting a bit much sure and i i'm excited to see this movie sans sans that little comic moment that those little uh as you say brevity moments I mean, um, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a few, don't get me wrong. Like we've got, there's, there's some levity in the, uh, you know, we do show like a bit of the history of kayaking in California and there's without a doubt some, some characters in there, you know? Um, and so I think that that part is, is, um, a pretty fun little, little section for sure. We talked about on the water beta moments here. What was your biggest, um, production beta moment? Like, do you show up like without a battery charged or no memory cards or like was there a standout moment where you're just like (sighs) yeah yeah for sure i mean you know what's interesting about this film is it's the first film um well i i hired a an an editor um who's actually uh become a great friend of mine and is now a a pretty good kayaker he was a total non-kayaker before but um but he worked in in Hollywood for years as an editor. And so he had a very like, um, structured system for how everything is set up. And I tend to sort of operate in this kind of like mad scientist type fashion where there's just like folders everywhere. (laughs) And I'm really not that organized. Um, and so when he looked at my initial, I had a rough cut of the film before I brought him in. And when he looked at my project file, he said that it was the worst project file he'd ever seen in his life um, and so we had to basically spend like I don't know at least a week just redoing the systems and um and getting it figured out and also like I think in my defense like I've also never done I mean I have my own sort of system but like when you're doing a film and you have 300 hours of archival and you have just all of this material to deal with and also the fact that Adobe just kind of sucks as a as an app and has its its own problems it's it, it all needs to be very very tidy and um it does have a lot of its own problems i can uh second that one yeah totally and, so and yeah let's, we... and let's be real rush when you're making kayak shred flicks no one cares what your timeline looks like they only care what the shred <laughs> flick looks like all right and sure. they want it out of the door yeah and if that yeah. means you and ben ma singing along in matching bathing suits and snorkels that's what they need no one cares what your timeline looks like it's true. No, it's, good. it's a good thing because otherwise nobody would ever like anything we ever make because they're so hard. How, how many people are working on this project? We've got, we know it's you. We know you had an editor. I remember uh, hearing you on Hammer Factor saying you also employed a writer. How many people total were working on this project? Oh, upwards of like, I would say, you know, like the core, the core group is really, I would say just mainly Aiden, myself and, and the writer there. And then, uh, but there's a lot of moving pieces. I mean, I did it, we did it. The other thing I'm really excited about this film is the all original soundtrack. Um, I mean, to answer your question, I'd say it's like upwards of 20 people, um, kind of like three core and then 10 that are, were pretty integral. I mean, I had a, you know, a a few different composers and that in and of itself was like, like a huge project. Um, I probably bit off a little more than I really needed to just because I was pretty determined to do it all original. And we ended up, I think, around 90, 90 percent original songs. And, you know, we were able to get like a real orchestra to play on it. And so there was kind of a lot of. um, Yeah, I mean, it's in retrospect, it's like you could probably just license something from a from a sound library that's going to like work. But, uh, you know, going the extra distance to make it 
original and also make it sound good was just like a, a process. And so we, you know, spent some time, spent a good chunk of time in the studio and, and uh, worked on some of the songs as well. And um, yeah, there was, there was a lot to it for sure. And did you write the score for this uh, original soundtrack or do you have a, a, a music person? Yes, yeah, so I have four different composers that I worked with and each kind of fulfilled a different sort of genre within the film. So I've got a buddy who does Rudy Slazuski. He kind of handled like the um, kind of Americana um, sort of vibe. And then Cyrus Reynolds kind of did like a lot of the orchestral stuff. Um, another guy, Joaquin Gomez, did kind of more like the world music. And then I got a guy, John Clark, who does more of kind of uh i would say like electronic orchestral kind of vibe um so i kind of tackled it from four different musicians because i was having a hard time getting it done with just one um and then and then no i don't i don't write the the score but um i mean i wrote the the a good chunk of the lyrics for for a couple of the songs um but my process is like basically finding reference music so like building out a sequence and then i use music that i just like um and sometimes layer that and mix it together and um it has been helpful because i've been learning to like make my own beats so i can i can talk the language a little bit now but um but i'm not a i don't play any instruments or anything so i'm mostly just giving direction in terms of how how i want it to feel and sound basically like more more bass direction or like i want to feel more sad direction yeah totally yep yeah like like we, you know i want yeah i want the oh yeah i want the emotion here to feel yeah whatever it is sad exciting again and oftentimes the, the footage kind of speaks for itself but um having reference music that, that i you know kind of like uh helps the composer for sure to find something that works you know was that the first time you've done a movie with a completely original score um this is the most original music i've done but every film i've done pretty much since like i mean for the last 10 years i've i've done a lot of original music i uh, worked with composers for it's just a much more um affordable way to do it uh and also like i i really like that it's uh i don't know it's just it's just super fun too i enjoy enjoy that part of the process it feels a lot less like work to me somehow than all the editing and everything else like the music is is mostly just really fun yeah, it sounds like uh, to me like I would much rather pick through a, a messy timeline and and recolor code it and and make your folders look tidy than get involved with uh, musical scores. To be honest, uh, really, that, that <laughs> That's sounds funny. that sounds hard. Like I would wait, 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 I would way rather just start making a nice folder system. You know, like I can I can jam with that. Um, now yeah. that you're kind of free and clear of this project and it's and it's done and and you can wipe your hands of it and say. The River Runner. I've done that. What, looking back on it, like, what was, the, what's your favorite part about the process, and what's your favorite part of the movie? Um, <laughs> I hate all of it. Uh, no, I, I think that um, I pruned all my favorite characters and all the, <laughs> all the stories that I wanted to explore. You know, yeah, right to no. cut out, and now I have to have an hour and a half about this bloody guy, Scott Lindgren, who now that I've heard him talk for two hours and 20 yeah. years of my life, I don't even want to hear talk anymore. Totally, dude. It's it's funny, like, um, I, you know, it, it's it's really hard at the end of these long projects because um, you just, you're, I'm so close to it at this point, and I'm so burnt out on it that um, it's like, uh, it, it's like tough to find the enthusiasm, but I'm definitely working on, on, having an attitude change on it. Cause I do, I know that there is something, um, kind of special within it. I think it's just that, uh, at this point I've just been at it for, for so long that it's like hard for me to even, um, I mean, I guess like, like kind of like what I pointed out earlier, I think like, I like the, the sort of passing of the torch between the generations, like with Aniol and, and, um, and with Scott, I think there's like a really kind of genuine sort of part in the film there um and then i don't know like i guess the best part for me is just that it's it's been a great learning process i think with all these films every time you make one like you're you're better set up for to do it more efficiently the next time and do it better so um in a lot of ways it's like you know i'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to kind of get a get an education in making this kind of film and um you know excited to 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 do the next one uh, I know we. I know you're allowed to say that it's uh, going to be widely available soon. Do you know the release date? 
yeah, it'll be available like pretty much everywhere by the end of um, by the end of this month. The end of August. That is that yeah. is when we're going to be able to see the River Runner. Um, all right, Rush. Let's get into the real. Well, I've got to actually. You know what? Before we get into my real questions, um, I do have a couple of questions for my Patreon supporters that I have to ask you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Question number one from Jonathan Rudell. Is emotional intelligence important to being a good paddler? Yeah, absolutely. Emotional intelligence is 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 very <laughs> important to being a good paddler. Um, I mean, it, I think that you have to surround yourself also with people that uh, make intelligent decisions. Um but, you know, it, it, you also can't let emotions sort of um, overpower you, you know, like I think fear can be a pretty good thing, but um, on the river, it doesn't necessarily always have like uh, too much of a place if you're letting that kind of interfere with your ability um, to paddle. Um, but I think, yeah, I think overall emotional intelligence is super, um, super crucial to being a, a successful kayaker. One, uh, I'm just uh, kind of picking picking back into what you just said there. Um, surrounding yourself with people is like a critical aspect of kayaking, right? Like fundamentally, kayaking is a team sport, even though on the surface it doesn't look like a team sport. But the decisions you make affect the people you're on the river with, right? Is that something that comes across or that you pick into in the in the film? Yeah, definitely, for sure. I mean, I, there's a there's a scene actually where you know, Charlie Munsey basically steps away from the sport because he's just getting, getting super spooked out there, you know, and I, and I've seen that happen, especially with kayakers as they get a little older, maybe they're not like as current as they used to be. They don't maybe have the same physical, um, uh, ability. And I think that, um, yeah, that's definitely something we kind of address is, is, you know, at what point do you, do you walk away from it? You know, the fire doesn't kind of, it doesn't burn forever. And I think like being able to, to make that call and say, you know, like I'm, I'm not where I used to be, um, is tough, you know, and especially it's, it's, it's also tough. Like if emotionally you're just not there anymore, like maybe you have like, like that's something I personally have, have felt as well. Like, I don't feel like I've lost like my, uh, skills as, as, as a kayaker. I feel like I'm still paddling, like, you know, honestly, like as good as I ever have, but, uh, I lack that sort of ability to like, um, you know, turn the fear off. And, and I think it's kind of part of it is biological as you get a little bit older, like maybe you're a little less, um, you know, willing to take risks and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of tough as, as a, as an aging paddler to uh to accept that but um you know that's definitely something that we kind of address in the, in the film a little bit of, in a, on a few different um occasions i think about that a lot i um haven't been paddling as much as i would have liked to in the last like year and a bit just for my old man played out shoulder problems you know and, mm -hmm. you know you, you, you were there I'm last familiar. time last I'm time familiar. you were there yep. you know <laughs> you were in it and I'm just, uh, I'm, almost, I'm on, you know, I'm on the uphill rise. I'm, I'm almost out of the, out of the woods on it. But um, I definitely feel like sometimes I'm just watching back through kayaking videos, and I'm just like, mm. well, and I, it, and I sometimes it, wonder if I am looking at like, so looking at like, uh, I don't know, Bren and Adrian, right, like charging, yeah. going super hard, and then maybe I look back through some old videos of mine, and I'm like. I wonder if I look back through those and the memories I have are like a little bit jaded. Like, I wonder if I just didn't remember that my shoulders were hurting a bit then, or if there was, if I had other aches and pains and niggles during that time that I'm just like gilding over and, and, you know, this time is really the same as that time. Yeah. I don't, yeah. That's a, I know. I, I, I think about that sometimes too. I think, um, and I can only speak from personal experience, but I think like at this point, like with, with, the age we're at, you know, like, and, and here moving forward, like it's, you're much it's older kinda, than me. Just, just, just yeah, to how, how, bracket how us here. You? How, you're how you're much you? older than me. I'm only 31. I'm still a very youthful <laughs> young man. Um, okay. I don't That's have any like gray my, hairs that you can see yet. Yeah. I got, I got like five years on you, but, um, but the, but you know, the process is never going to change as far as, I mean, especially with these shoulders, like I am, I'm at the gym three days a week working on my shoulders, you know, like it's, it's going to be a lifelong 
thing uh, to keep those intact. And I'm sure that they'll, you know, hopefully they're not going to get injured again. But, um, you know, if I keep running hard white water, it's like, it's hard to, um, I don't know, it's hard for it to be the way that it was, but that's also like, okay, like I'm actually pretty stoked. I'm like really stoked with where I'm at with, with kayaking. It doesn't like, I don't, you know, of course I get like some FOMO watching what the boys and, and, and gals are up to out there. Like it's in, it's oh, yeah. insane watching, oh, watching yeah. Brent and Adrian and Noria and Dane. And it's, it's just on oh, such, yes. funny. it's on such another level, you know, like on the old, like it, it really is, um, inspiring and exciting to see. And it's, it, uh, I think, you know, like, a while back, it might be, it would have been maybe harder for me to feel like, you know, like, oh man, I should like be there doing that. Um, and I still get that like FOMO a little bit, but like my life's in a different, I'm in a different space now. I'm, I'm, I'm um, I don't want to say that I'm, I'm never going to say that I'm like retiring or anything like that, but it certainly is transitioning. And I have these other, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, and for you too, I'm sure it's just like, it's about finding, you know, the things that still make you stoked. And for me, that still is kayaking all the time. Like I'm still stoked on it. It's just, it's not as, um, at the moment anyway, it's not as international as it used to be. It's not as gnarly. It's, um, you know, it's just what, what still kind of makes me happy though. So that's, uh, that's where I'm at with it. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with everything you said there. That was a bit, a little bit tangential, I guess, from Jonathan Riel's question there, but uh, I, yeah. think we answered it. No. I think we answered it okay. Okay, yeah, next one, also over. from, next question, also from Jonathan Riddell. How do the economics of these river films work? It took three and a half years to make this. Is that full time? Uh, have you, do you have your lim limited budget, limited travel days, limited shooting days? Is it possible yeah. to make money from a project like this? Great, great question. Um, this is this the story. the The story of this film is actually kind of wild in terms of how the uh, the financing happened. Um, I mean, so traditionally, I've always gotten um, funding for films through sponsors. That's just the way I've always done it. And uh, I, I, at the very beginning of this film, I, I thought that it would not be too difficult for me to get funding because I just finished Niagara and that was a success, and um, actually did really well for Red Bull, and they you know, they did, they did really well financially on it and they bought me out of it. Um, but, uh, I just couldn't get any funding and they will, I, I seriously sent this proposal back in 2017 to every corporate sponsor I could possibly think of, um, couldn't get any traction. So I actually used my own money to, to go to Pakistan with the crew and, and film, um, you know, Scott running the Indus cause that's kind of the crux of the film. And that was back when the film was just going to kind of be like a, you know, a short film. Um, and then once I got back from the trip and I, you know, shot these interviews, I realized that this definitely needed to be a, a feature film. And, uh, it was at that point I was able to put together like a little sizzle reel. And so I could use that sizzle, uh, to try to drum up some additional funding. And I actually got the sizzle, um, over to a couple different investors. And so I was actually able to raise, um, money privately. And so that's like kind of the way that, that films are often kind of traditionally done is somebody, a producer will give money to a project and then they'll get, you know, their money back plus some once the film sells. Um, and that's a little more challenging in the documentary world because these films don't typically make a lot of money. Um, sometimes, sometimes they do. It is kind of like the golden age of, of documentary filmmaking because, people are actually really interested in docs now. And there's, you know, these platforms that are sometimes paying a lot of money for movies. Um, but, uh, but the short, the, this is kind of a long answer. Sorry, but, uh, I ended up, yeah, raising, we raising have money time. Through, so take, yeah. take your time. Do not, do not rush. Um, uh, ended up, yeah, raising money from a couple investors. I also got, um, a, a grant through a foundation and then, uh, yeah, it just kind of was like this, this battle from start to finish of like a little money here, a little money there. Um, and so, yeah, I would say it was, you know, kind of semi, semi full-time job for, for the three and a half years, but at the same time I was still, still paddling, still doing other film projects. I have a, some other short films that are also coming out and, um, have come out over the last couple of years. So, uh, Anyway, yeah. So, long story short, to 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 actually make money on it on this film, I was actually um, we were able to get it sold, and um, I can't talk too much about that right now. But it, uh, yeah, in the end, this this is has been. I think if I if you break down my hourly rate on this, it was not not a huge money maker when you consider all the hours and all the time. Um, 
but you don't really get into these types of projects uh, to try to make lots of of money. But I'm I'm really grateful that that we were able to sell the film because it's it, the, the odds are not in your favor. I think it's only like one percent of you know these these documentary films like actually get sold to to a distributor. So um, really really lucky on that front. And yeah, I'll be able to walk away. Um, with a bit of, of a salary here for like the next kind of 18 months. And, and that's, that's huge because for me, this whole thing has been a grind for three and a half years, a lot of my own personal money put into it, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's paying off, I would say like reasonably well, it's not, a, this isn't like a huge, huge money maker, but it's like, I'm, I'm grateful at the same time. That is a solid answer. Um, and I am sure Jonathan is going to appreciate that I certainly appreciated hearing the inner workings of um, the differences of documentary films between kayaking films. And uh, that's something I've never, I don't know anything about. And I'm sure most people also don't know much about. So they'll appreciate that. Last question from the Patreon, the Patreon peoples. Emily Wade says, vegan rhymes, part de. <laughs> vegan rhymes, what? Part de, which is oh, part, two, say, the part two. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Not the I'm not very well well versed in the uh, Francais. Um, yeah, okay, we can we can make that happen at some point. I'll 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 put it on my list. I've got nothing else on there right now, so um, you know, it's top of the list. Let's get on to the real the real question. Last time you were on this podcast, before it was a podcast, when it was just um, when I didn't know what before I knew it was going to be a podcast. And thanks to Ben Ma for encouraging me to upload it to a podcast and make the pursue the podcast format um you did a nice rap for us which ended up in quite the back and forth between you and big man's rotisserie uh in yeah. white salmon totally i have thoroughly enjoyed the whole back and forth and it was very creative and insightful and i enjoyed it immensely are you guys cool oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. we've we settled we've settled the beef um and uh yeah big big man and i are, are cool again but you never know when the beef could pop off it, it could at any moment really has he started offering vegan options at his place yet are you uh are you yeah he that? actually does he does offer or you know he's not open currently but he did offer a pretty good um a pretty good cabbage option at uh at one stage in time there that was my go-to for sure down that sounds uh that sounds quite delicious i'd, I'd get down on that definitely um but yeah no 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 vegan wraps at the at the yeah nothing nothing new at the moment although i do i do actually i should i should plug that i do have a new i'll have a new album coming out here fairly soonish that has also been simultaneously been working on that over the i was gonna the ask past. about that because my my release radar uh on spotify popped up with the rush Durgis song uh a few weeks ago yeah. I, was, I meant to text it <laughs> to you and then i forgot um but i was like i know that wait a second and i like flipped my phone over and i was like huh good job spotify <laughs> nice yeah it, it takes me a hot minute to get them put, to, put together i feel like i'm on the like you know ep or an album every kind of like five to six years and it's been about i think it's been six five years i think since the last release so it's taken me that amount of time to kind of get together some new tracks but i'm pretty um pretty excited about the new um the new stuff I have put together and, and, uh, yeah, I should, I think it's going to have like 12, 12 songs on, on the album. So, um, yeah, you can any, catch. Do you have any fun collaborations that we can sing along to? Like on the last one, there's one where the, the chorus is like, Better! and I've been on a couple road <laughs> yeah. trips where everyone's in the truck and at the same <laughs> time, everyone will be like, Better! yeah, there's definitely a lot of, um, a lot Hang of guest words. features. A lot of guest features and collaborations for for sure um and i and i'm still it's going to be a hot minute because i have kind of i have all the demos recorded but i still have to spend like realistically i say soon but it's like it's probably going to be like another year for me <laughs> to actually pull it off you know and is that all you're doing next uh, just making your album and making your, your next album and hanging out or do you have any other things in the works things planned things that we should be excited about things that people should know about that you're working on yeah i mean i'm actually i am um taking a, a chunk of time this starting this fall i'm going to do four months and i'm planning on on just working on this album um that's kind of my goal right now is to get um 
you know, get a lot of it finished in the next kind of six months. And then I have a couple other little projects. Like I'm still pretty deep with river runner. We're doing a lot of film festivals and travel. So I'm, I'm also traveling a ton, um, for that. And then, um, and then, yeah, I don't know, like moving forward, I've got a couple other kind of things in the, in the pipeline. Um, but, uh, but that's kind of the, uh, the immediate sort of future. I am pretty keen to, to, to really focus on the music and actually try to, try to make it uh, a priority to get this thing um, put together. Excellent news. Rush, I have um, asked all the questions I think no one else has thought to ask and uh, I didn't even know I was going to ask some of them. So I don't have anything else to ask you. Um, is there anything else you would like to say before we sign off here? And also how can people uh, find you, follow The River Runner? I'm sure it has its own website by now, um, you know, YouTube not youtube instagram you know the other stuff tell tell about how tell people about how to follow you and your work yeah honestly just social media is probably the best um uh at rush sturgis uh river roots website and um yeah that's that's pretty much it and yeah thanks for thanks for taking the time you ask uh you ask pretty solid questions there seth i have to say not not bad not bad for, thank you very much <laughs> this has been questions you never thought to ask the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast with Rush Sturgis and Seth Ashworth. Peace. <laughs>